All right, so I'll hit this button here, and uh, we'll see what happens. Dance off, bro. Me and you. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Side Scheme, a podcast about everybody's favorite superhero card game, Marvel Champions. I'm your host, I'm Banana Crapshoot, and I am joined once again, as always, by my perfectly balanced co-host, Tommy of Titan. Tommy, how are you? I am great. Just got my first playthrough of Kang done in the books, and I was on the losing end, uh, which I'm happy to report because I, I am a masochist, and I always like it when the villain wins. It gives me something to shoot for. So uh, I'm pumped, and I'm also pumped about our guest tonight. Why don't you introduce our guest? Why don't you, why don't you take that one? We have the uh, the man who conquered the time stream, Caleb Grace. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I like that. Master of time. It's a, it's a, pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty lofty uh, thing to do. It's fitting. It's fitting. Thanks for being here, Caleb. We greatly appreciate your spending a few minutes with us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just. I'm wishing Nate could be here now too, because uh, when you say "master of time," I just hear him singing. You know, if I could turn back time, that's like <laughs> one of his favorite inside jokes. You know, anytime it comes up, anyone time someone's talking about time, he's like, "Caleb, what would you do if you could turn back time?" And then he starts singing. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's like his karaoke jam. No, I haven't done karaoke with Nate. I, I don't know if that's his thing or not, but. He's got a lot of these jokes that he really likes, and, and that's one that, that just comes up, you know. And that's kind of his style. Is like the first co- couple times he makes the joke, you're like not really sure why he's laughing, and then he just keeps doing it, and it just becomes funny. You know? <laughs> it's the best kind of joke. Yeah. So All right. we got some uh, yep. interesting stuff going on in the Marvel Champions community. I think we have more... I have more things that I want to play that I don't have time to play and or people to come play with <laughs> than ever before. I mean, aside from like when I got the core set and then immediately followed up by that double hero release and then uh, the goblin pack, like there's just so much to do for Marvel champions right now that I'm, I'm literally overwhelmed. I can't get it all out. That was our goal. Yeah. That was our goal. <laughs> it, was, it was just to like really string you along and then completely overwhelm you. Mission accomplished. <laughs> we got, I mean, I haven't even played Hawkeye yet. That's how much, like, there's just... Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, there's, like, a, you know, we're the the um, the um two gentlemen I play with, like, we're always debating who's going to get what. And uh, the one guy, my friend Scott, is has been really in the Hawkeye lately. So he's been playing Hawkeye with all the different aspects. So I haven't had a, a chance to, to give him a try yet. But, man, I'm just having fun mixing in. I mean, you, we got three, like, good chunks of, like aspect cards you know we got the leadership the aggression and the justice so i mean that drastically just even changes deck building for any number of heroes i mean that the possibilities are pretty vast at this point and then all the villain stuff to do with all the modular sets it's it's overwhelming you guys are doing a great job over there i'm not just saying well thank you no i really appreciate it do you have like a account is this kept track at ffg is the total possible number of like scenario combinations you can throw together is that like a, a no, thing? No, <laughs> I, I don't think that's something we're actually keeping track of. Uh, what's What's nice about the uh, the modular encounter sets is that uh, that's really up to the players how they want to mix and match. You know, we don't. I don't think we really have to worry about uh, balance issues or anything like that because uh, ultimately we're crafting each scenario with a way that's sort of more or less intended to be played you know and that's that's your recommended sets that's what you see on the on the setup main scheme or in the rules and so that's that's really where our focus is when we're developing it um from there we just kind of feel like everything else that you can change in and out is just added value so if for some reason you know you find a combo that just doesn't work and and it feels like you know, it's not meant to be, then it's really no loss from, from my point of view because you go, okay, well, that one combination doesn't seem to work. That's okay. I just won't do that again. Um, so, no, we, we try to keep track of more like the player card pool with all the different aspects um, and the cards we're adding to the pool. We're, you know, we are really trying to make sure that that part is balanced because obviously 
all of those aspect cards are intended to be bind together in different ways. And so that's one of the things we ask our play testers to help us with because there's just not enough time for Boggs and I to, to do all of that testing. So when we put up those cards, we'll, we'll ask our testers to really get in there and try to highlight any tr uh, problem cards or try to break different combos, you know. Um, but on the modular side, I think it's it's kind of nice because each scenario is its own thing, self-contained. So if, if for some reason there's just a weird combo in a scenario, then that's unique to that one scenario. I think it's a sign of the like how just good the mechanics and baseline of this game are that, like, like you said, there's really nothing coming to mind that I'm like, oh, that just duck flat out doesn't work or isn't interesting in any way. Like any combination that I can think of, like everything pretty much works. I'm sure there's some combinations that are more potent than others. I, like uh, we used to do, uh, I can't even remember the, the tombstone modular set so that you get the media coverage when you're playing uh, expert mutagen because you get all these encounter cards right away. And then maybe you get doubled up on the, when revealed, but just to, to add that extra risk. But I mean, that's there's just so many things that that to explore in this game right now. It's fabulous. Well, it's only going to get better from there. So I'm, I'm glad <laughs> to care how much you're enjoying it. It is kind of funny to think like, well, we went about six months with uh, half of the number of scenarios available, and and now with just a you know within the space of a month we have five new scenarios in Rise of Red Skull plus the, the Once in Future Kang. So it feels right. Like I was I was really like anxious for this, you know, September, October for this content to, to come out because it really felt from my point of view like people are really only experiencing like just a little bit of what we have to offer for this game. So I'm really happy for everybody that's been enjoying the game up to this point and, and sticking with it, you know, uh, anxiously waiting for this to drop and the reception has been really encouraging since uh since it's finally come out nice yeah i was gonna ask about uh like red skull uh and the campaign mm -hmm. box and like every the feedback you guys have gotten on it and um the reception it's gotten if it was overly positive or if there's like some negative things uh oh, i was so nervous i was so nervous about uh rise of red skull um just because it's the first product of this type that we've ever done you know, so obviously we have a pretty good indication from our own playtesting and internal development and then also from playtesters, you know, that, that we know that there's something here of real value, something that we're proud of, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee it's going to find its audience, you know, which is talk to any creative person. You know, most people when they make a, a movie or write a book or, you know, release an album or whatever it is that they do, you know, they're all putting in the time and then the effort and but not all of them are winners right you know like so you, know, you kind of wonder like where does it go wrong and you know or did it go wrong maybe it just didn't find its audience and so of course i'm a little nervous you know working on something that um i feel like the game really kind of hinges like this is the first you know campaign box this is the the main vessel for adding new scenario content really like to make a good first impression, right? You only get one of those. So, yeah, I, I got a little nervous when um, there was, like, a couple people. It sounds like they picked it up early, like, on a Thursday, you know, before uh, mass release, and their reviews were a little more reserved, a little bit more of unfavorable comparisons to, like, Arkham, where I think because of the name campaign expansion or campaign box or whatever we're calling it, I think they were expecting something more like Arkham where it's, you know, Arkham's very much about that campaign. And, uh, you know, so the kind of first impressions were a little bit lukewarm, you know, they weren't really excited. It was kind of like, uh, you know, if you guys were hoping for a really in-depth campaign, well, you might be disappointed. And, and what was hard about that for me is like, yeah, this, this box was, it was never first and foremost about the campaign experience. It was first and foremost about getting five new, scenarios into the game five new villains to fight the campaign is really just this added value of not only do you get five new villains to fight but you can also uh combine them into one overarching adventure if that's your thing um so yeah when when the first reviews were like ah oh, the campaign's not that strong i got really nervous and thought maybe we didn't do a very good job of 
kind of like getting the message out there about exactly what this product is. But then you know, I think when Friday came around and you could kind of tell um, about the time that people were getting home from work and it picked up their copy and we're playing through. And by Saturday, there were just like all kinds of positive reviews with people saying, yeah, it's not as deep as Arkham, but that's okay. That's, you know, if I want that, I'll play Arkham. What it is is it's five awesome villains and two exciting heroes and some really fun adventures. And the campaign is great if you just want a kind of a lighthearted romp. And I was thinking, awesome, we, we found our audience because that's exactly what we were going for, right? So that, yeah, uh, since then, it's, it's kind of just, I, I feel like it's almost snowballed where, you know, um, more and more people are, picking it up and, and kind of sharing those comments. So it's, yeah, it's a really good feeling. And what's awesome too, from my point of view, is that it's only going to get better. You know, like this is our first one. We're kind of blazing a trail, kind of exploring what, um, you know, what, what this kind of product can be. And I already know that people are going to love, 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 love the, uh, the Galaxy's Most Wanted when that comes out. Like, Boggs absolutely knocked it out of the park with that product. And so if you guys like this one, like I guarantee you're going to love the next one which is really exciting to think about yeah it's 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 per, to, to continue on what you said it's like it feels like the campaign box is perfectly on like your mission statement of like the casual gamer like i don't know if i'm articulating it correctly but like how it's an accessible game to everybody but now you can kind of string the the campaign together or the scenarios together a little smoother than you could um in, in before like the even the core set had like a, a very loose story behind it where you could kind of play the three in succession and it would feel good mm -hmm. um yeah, but yeah I, I think it's mm -hmm. i think it's amazing and yeah I we just didn't have a, a map yeah well thank you it's unbelievable it's a work of art <laughs> oh, yeah that's high praise <laughs> actually I want to give a shout out to uh, to Brady Sadler if I can because uh, he and I are Facebook friends and he's been very very generous with his uh, support for the game and uh, this was like a thread I was sort of tagged on but he wasn't actually replying to me it was uh, he was just sharing how excited he was uh, to pick up the product and play through it and one of his friends asked him you know about it they're like you know how is it and his reply I wish we could just like put in quotations and slap it on the box like you know kind of like when you you movie reviews right like roger eber gives his two <laughs> thumbs up you know it's out of this world action says rolling stone and i want you know it's a goddamn treasure trove brady sadler you know? <laughs> that was just the best most exciting phrase that i've ever gotten from anything i worked on i was like wow i just want to slap that on the box like a, like a sticker although we probably have to no edit it for edit out some of the comments or something to defeat the purpose <laughs> if, if you if you like that ego boost wait till we get to kang because i'm just gonna go oh, through, like nobody's business <laughs> yeah i just wanted to touch on red skull quick because i mean it is a great product and like our discord that we have for the side scheme is is like a small but like very healthy uh community i think and i think we all overwhelmingly positive love it like what it adds to the game is great really glad like i said i was i was nervous about you know comparisons to arkham pardon me just because of the you know the title of campaign it actually came up in testing you know there were testers who were sort of expressing this idea of you know, i kind of wish there was more campaign elements and um and i kind of had to respond to that at one point as it was starting to steer the conversation off into something that i knew the box could never be uh, partly just because the limitations of card count, you know, to get five scenarios and two heroes, you only have so many cards to work with. You know? So to even have cards left over to do any kind of campaign element, you know, takes careful planning. So I I wasn't upset with the comments or, or hurt by them or anything. I just wanted to kind of clarify for my testers to help focus the testing process and realized in the moment I did that, I was like, boy, this would be really good for the audience to know as well. That I just pointed out, like, you know, it's, it's never going to be like Arkham. Arkham's the RPG LCG. It's, it's all about leveling up and, and unlocking new powers and everything as you go through the campaign. Like, basically, the right way to play Arkham is the campaign. If you're, if you're playing Arkham scenarios standalone, that's fine. It's fun, but it's not really what the game is designed for, whereas Marvel's almost the opposite, right? Like, Marvel's very much about 
let's just get it to the table for 30, 40 minutes or however long we have. Just have a great time just, you know, getting up on Taskmaster or whoever. Uh, but if you actually have like an entire afternoon or the better part of a day, then maybe you actually want to play the whole campaign, um, you know, all in one go. And that was what I saw the real value being. That was actually some of the most fun I had play testing and developing this product was uh, with my buddy Ryan Freilich. We would actually meet up on Sundays at the uh, FFG Game Center. And, uh, and we do a little play testing, and we would actually just play through the whole campaign from start to finish in an afternoon. Just the, the two of us, it would take maybe maybe like four hours to, to start on um, Crossbones and, and play all the way through Red Skull. And I thought that was really exciting to have uh, a campaign that you could finish and get the whole experience, you know, in one day. Because I, I, I thought there's got to be a place on the market for that, too, where, like, Arkham's definitely, this is going to take several sessions, Right. Whereas this is like, wow, we got that whole story. We got the entire story from start to finish in one afternoon. So I, I hope some other people are getting to uh, have those kind of experiences too. I've got three campaigns running right now. So with different <laughs> people, my solo, I've got all kinds of, so I'm, and I'm trying to get my wife to do one with me too. So yeah, awesome. I'm ambitious with how many I've got going on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. How do you have time for all that? I don't. That's the thing. I, yeah. I just sleep. <laughs> I, have, I have two children. One is two, one is one. So yeah, we don't sleep a lot. I just game. I was going to say, you're already not getting much sleep at that yeah. age. <laughs> Something's got to give at some point. Right. Yeah, for oh, sure. Oh, man. Well, Tom, you want to move into Kang? I know you've been you've been waiting all, all week right. to, to get, in, or get um, into Kang. I, I was excited from the get-go because Kang is one of my favorite villains i think he's a very underrated villain i've always liked time travel but anyway i mean so excited just coming up to it honestly my hopes got to a, uh, a point where i thought there's no way i'm gonna be disappointed it was kind of where i was at i was like there's no way it's gonna deliver and i'm, I'm one of the players i've heard you reference before like um when you test you, you primarily are testing like the pre-cons i'm one of the people that likes to deck build i like to crank the difficulty up i'm always starting on expert and and i, I enjoy a challenge and holy crap, Kang was amazing. I just envisioned the scene from Iron Man 2 when Justin Hammer's talking about his ex-wife missile and he's pitching it to <laughs> War Machine. And right. and it's it's just like it's this is this is like the pinnacle of like what I've always wanted for this. It's so good. It's so incredible. I love it. I'm gonna literally lose sleep tonight in a good way about just thinking about the next time I get to play Kang. Love it. I'm super satisfied to hear that. Uh, thank you very much. For I'm whatever over. one random guy's opinion is <laughs> worth, it was the be- it's the best, the most fun I've had gaming in in years. Like it's it was just so much fun. And and I, I looked across my friend Scott. Uh, he, he's playing with me. You know, we're meeting in small groups for consistently for a while now. And he's sitting across the table from me. And I said, Scott, are you having fun? And he looked up at me, and he had just gotten to the point where he had um, the two obligations. I can't remember what they are. And I guess this is kind of spoiler territory now. But the two obligations that pull eight cards off the top of your deck um, yeah. and just go under it, he had two of them out. And then we pulled the uh, the side scheme that says you can't trigger the alter ego actions on those. So he <laughs> like literally was missing half his deck. And he's Hawkeye, and there's like all his arrows are in there. And he just looks up at me. He goes, "I'm having so much fun, and I can't even do anything." It was was this weird moment of like painful euphoria. I don't even know what was happening, but I loved it. So I'll I'll stop uh, gushing at this point. Well, no, I'm curious. Like, you know, is it the challenge that makes it so much fun? Is it is it just because you're such a fan of Kang, or is there? something else you know like what is it that's because that's, that's actually really useful feedback for for me as a designer to hear like what is it that's really you know um eliciting that that response of what's making it so much fun for you well i spent some time i don't want to bore everybody but i did take apart everything and just kind of like look at the the math behind it and i, I think it, it has to do with a couple things i, I mean the theme and, and and the villain himself definitely helps i liked the complexity of it um I do like things a little meatier, so I like that. I also went in blind, so I didn't know exactly what to expect. 
um, which adds to the experience. But I, I realize that's something I'm only going to ever get once. Um, but I like how it was so spread out where we have the eight obligations, the six uh, attachments, the six treacheries. Uh, I think it's the three minions. It, this is just strictly the Kang set, not the modules. Yeah, so he's got the macrobots. Yes. So, uh, but it just, they all feel so like they, they like they're balanced so nicely like there's these tempo hits where you know you're like what you do as a hero just becomes less when when you're like you take damage to trigger your your uh basic stats or you know he's ripping nine cards from your deck and you don't really know what they are right away so it's like oh do i want to take that tempo hit of spending a resource to get it back if i even have this mental resource or maybe that was the one card i really need to play this turn and you can't afford to do it there was just so many wonderful, like, nuanced tempo hits in there. And, and I, I think allies are extremely powerful. So I loved seeing things like retaliate on the macro bots, which can devalue an ally in some sense. And also mm -hmm. the future weapon giving you overkill. There's just so many little... I mean, I'm sure you don't even remember all the cards at this point because you're you're off in like seven seven encounters later future. Well, I'm actually I'm actually on the Hall of Heroes right now, so I can see them all in front of me. <laughs> okay, so that's I can never remember them off the top of my head, but yeah, it just never it felt so so good the entire time. Like every encounter card that came out had us waiting. Like we knew we were like right when we thought we caught our breath and we're going to stabilize. Like you know things got a little complicated. Um, for the heroes not in in like game mechanic sense but like mm -hmm. complicated our plan it just felt like a really great and maybe it's the decks we're playing maybe it's our skill level it, it was right for that i don't know but for me it hit on every level i i also really like the fact that you can't cancel obligations outside of maybe the black widow ally i think like you can't uh winds of not winds of Witton, the uh, protective ward or get behind me or any of those tricks mm -hmm. where you can cancel the treacheries and the when reveals. Right. So I think that that really helps it because there's not much you can do in those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we were pretty excited to play with the obligation card type with this scenario. Uh, trying to think of a fun way to represent you know, Kang's uh, time machinations, right? The way he can just travel back in time and, and disrupt you know, the hero's past. And he always has to be so careful about it, right, in order to not to throw the, the present or the future into chaos. So mm -hmm. he's like a time surgeon, you know. But I just love the idea that he's going back in time and, like, just do it, just tweaking something a little bit to uh, throw the heroes off their game. And the obligation seem like the perfect card type to do that. And we're always looking for reasons, too, to encourage players to flip back and forth between hero and alter ego and take advantage of that you know, mechanic that's really central to the game. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like the idea of like, uh, like with depowered, you know, you got the picture of Steve Rogers, you know, being zapped by Kang. And that's such a thing with, with Captain America. Like he's always getting depowered, you know, it turns <laughs> into an old man and he's got to, he's got to find a way to get his powers back. And that seemed like something you should have to flip to alter ego to figure out how to do, you know, go run some tests or something. So yeah, I'm glad that worked out for you guys. It was great. <laughs> I don't even know what else to say. <laughs> so good. Banana, save me here. Say something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you said a lot of what I would say. I mean, it was, I think it's my favorite scenario to this point. Uh, I've, pl I've played it twice. I've lost both times on Expert um, to Threat. Um, I think I was like four damage short one game and seven damage short the other game and just the whole design the flow of the game how everything works with Kang I'm just super into um, I you love splitting up tripped up yeah I was just gonna ask about that the the whole splitting up thing that that for me was like the the biggest thing is trying to figure out how to execute something like that that doesn't like just throw the players completely off right like it's in, in theory, it's, it, you know, when you describe it by talking, it's really simple. You're like, oh, you each get your own player, and here's, you know, you each get your own card. And I don't think it's a tough concept for people to grasp, but trying to do it all in writing, you know, without someone there who already knows how it works, I, yeah. I find that's that's the real challenge, right? That's, that's the trick. So how did that go for you guys? Were you able to parse that out okay? Yeah, so I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I have a couple – just a couple quick like one-off like interactions if you don't mind just with mm -hmm. the like the wording of the play area when you sure. when 
um, like I'm assuming, and and we play, we tried to use the, I think it's the grim rule where we don't anything that would favor us. We were just like, yeah, we'll just go the opposite to play safe. Mm-hmm. Um, so like calling for actions, that's clearly not happening when you're in separate play areas, correct? Right, right. Yeah, we assume that. Um, I had an espionage at one point. I can't trigger it if his uh, encounter card reveals surge. That's correct, right? Yeah, I'm actually pulling out the rules. Okay, um, I'm sorry. It's, it's been, no, it's okay, it's okay. Um, happy to do it. Oh, except I accidentally pulled up the card file instead of the rule file, which is not going to help me answer that question. So, um, your question was about what card now? What, what interaction it was, uh, specifically? Espionage. It says when you when a card, when an encounter card has surge, you can trigger it to draw two. It's oh, it's, okay. So, so someone draws uh, or reveals a card with surge, mm-hmm. and they're in a different play area. Yes. Yeah. Correct. No, you can't. You can't do anything. It's, yeah. It's sort of like imagine imagine you're at Gen Con, right, or any other event, or maybe you're just at your local game store and you're at one table playing a game, and somebody else is at another table playing a completely different game. You wouldn't for one moment think that when this person at another table reveals a card, that you could play your card to cancel it because they're playing a totally different game from you. Yeah, that is essentially the same as when you're split up from each other. Um, at, at stage three there everyone has their own play area it's almost like you're sitting at a different table and I think there was just like a couple exceptions that we call out in the rules like you're still I think you're still passing the first player token between two people I can't remember if, well, I remember yeah. that being kind of a debate it was like are we still passing the first player token at that point <laughs> <laughs> um, yes that, that was a specific rule that we actually called out so yeah you still you still take turns in order, and you still pass the first player token. So yeah, there's a couple exceptions that are called out in the rules, but other than that, you're you're really meant to think about it like you're at a different table playing in a totally different game. That's that's exactly how I we figured that's how it was intended. So that's what we were doing. Mm-hmm. One, one other question I had was uh, acceleration tokens on the main mm-hmm. scheme. Do they mm-hmm. do they apply uh, during step one of the villain phase when you would? Do they apply to like both? Um, when players? you're all split up? Yeah. No, again, when you're split up, yeah, nothing at another person's area is affecting you. Okay. Uh, including, in, including, including stage 2B in the middle, it will have some acceleration tokens on it, but mm-hmm. they're not, they're not going to speed up your stage 3. They're actually being held there until you get to stage 4, and then they'll be placed on stage 4. That was... Um, that was actually part of part of our way to address a weird issue unique to this scenario that normally when you reveal a side scheme on a, like a main scheme one in any other scenario if you have a side scheme you're going to want to get rid of that side scheme right mm-hmm. um, and devote some resources to doing that but without that little bit of text where um, you know you, you have to put acceleration tokens on the main scheme for each side scheme before they're removed um, originally they were just removed and then my testers pointed out like you know that's a huge advantage for the players if I reveal a side scheme it's basically like a free card normally a side scheme is like the worst card I could get now it's like a freebie I just leave it there and wait till we advance and then it goes away I was like oh yeah yeah, that you should definitely be punished for doing that <laughs> so that's where the acceleration tokens came from um, so I think yeah, yeah, Master of Time says force interrupt when an acceleration token would be placed on another scheme, place it here instead. So that part that part is affecting you. That's another like called out like specific rule. That was another thing too, right? About like if you've got an acceleration token on your stage three, it's just gonna go away. So it's like nope, it's gonna go here instead. Okay. Yeah, so that text is active, but the acceleration tokens are not impacting your stage threes. So nice. I got one more question, if you don't mind. Not at all, not at all. The time travel tactics card. Um, mm-hmm. It says, and I think I understand why it's worded the way it is, but I'm just curious. When revealed, each player takes one indirect damage for each obligation in their play area. So mm-hmm. when we're all fighting uh, one scheme and we're together, is the your play area basically every obligation in play under every player's control? 
or is it just the ones af affecting you? But each player always has their own play area, whether okay. you're separated or not. Each player always has their own player, and you and you okay. understand that kind of instinctively when you put your hero down, and when you play an upgrade, you don't put it in front of your friend, you put it in front of you mm -hmm. because that's your play area. Okay. What this scenario does that I understand how it creates a little confusion is that when you split up to stage your own stage three, it says your own play area is now also your own game area. You know, it kind of expands that. Yep. Um, so really what time travel hijinks does in if you're at stage one or four, if you're all together, um, revealing that everybody's going to have to take damage equal to the number of obligations right in front of them. So I might have one, you might have two, someone else might have none. Um, that's just how that works. But if I reveal that at a stage three, if I'm the only person at that stage three, then I'm the only one resolving this card. Oh, okay, so that only is going to affect you. It's not going to affect the other players. Right. Again, it's like mm -hmm. I'm at another table, and you cool. didn't even see this card get revealed. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, cool. So that's that's basically how I had always interpreted it, but then adding, you know, these circumstances just made me rethink basically everything. So. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. That's We had, you know, you can see from the rules, we had quite a few good yeah. questions come up so we added that you know rules clarification section but i don't think that one came up otherwise i would have been happy to try to squeeze that in there if i could have found space no, not, <laughs> honestly the rules clarifications were super helpful we referenced it multiple times and were able to find answers so or at least even good. just to get an idea well, i guess uh, i guess i did kind of answer it in the first one as, as far as that each player refers to each player in the in the same gaming area so if you're the only one then each player refers only to you. So I at least address that part of it. But I, I understand yeah. how how the way of being separated and brought to, back together can make you look at your play area differently when you come back together. Awesome. So when you... Was Kang, like, um, part of your, like, original vision? Like, when you pitched, like, Kang to, to Marvel or whatever? Like, when you, when you pitched the game? Uh, was... No, I, I don't think Kang was part of that, and, and neither was the Rise of Red Skull. Like, our original our original pitch, like, included, you know, the core set and the first six hero packs, and I think it included the first two villain packs as well. So all of that Wave 1 content was was really decided from the beginning. And I think we were lean, already leaning toward, you know, Red Skull kind of Hydra theme. But I don't think it was really solidified till we kind of had the the core set was was finished and then off to production and then uh, you know wave one was more or less wrapping up. That's when we got our first opportunity to take a real hard look at okay, what's next? Um, there was yeah, there was like no, there definitely wasn't any debate. Everybody was on board with with a Hydra theme and Red Skull right from the beginning. And then a little while later, we started talking about. You know, hey, should we do some kind of scenario that we could bring to Gen Con? You know, kind of like we do for Arkham and Lord of the Rings. And uh, you know, what could we do that would highlight the multiplayer aspect of this? You know, if you're going to an event, you know, no one, no one's going to Gen Con and playing a solo game of Marvel Champions. You know, you're going to be playing with probably all four players. Uh, so we wanted to highlight it, but we didn't want to make it exclusively multiplayer. I mean, that's the plan was always to sell it. As a, as a villain pack, same as Green Goblin and Wrecking Crew, so it needs to be fully playable with just uh, one player. Um, so it's like that's 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 kind of a conundrum right there, right? It's like how do you create a, a multiplayer scenario that really highlights how much fun it is to play with you know three or four other people, uh, sorry, up to three or four people or you know whatever, and then but also feels like a complete experience with just one player, and uh, just because of the time constraints we're under. Uh, at that time, I was like, well, why don't we just take a page out of Lord of the Rings book and take this this really popular Foundations of Stone scenario that uh, Lucas Litzinger designed way back in the day um, that, that people still enjoy today, right? It's, it's really got that staying power because it was the first scenario for that game where players could be separated from each other and have their own quest that they had to uh, to overcome and then join back with the uh, with the other players. It just seemed like a tried and true formula, and 
you know, something that we could adapt for Marvel that could be done in a really fun and exciting way. And so from there, it was kind of like, okay, what villain? What villain would actually be best for something like that? Because I, I think this was a rare case of where we actually decided on on the mechanics before we picked the theme. Uh, usually it's the, the other way around. Like, usually we know we want to do Red Skull, and then we figure out the mechanics based on what would Red Skull do. But in this case, we knew we wanted, um, you know, this particular type of scenario design. And so it was like, what kind of villain would separate people from each other and give them a reason to come back together? And um, It might just be because I had been reading some uh, Uncanny Inhumans uh, story with Kang or... Uh, or I don't know exactly what, but um, Kang was the first one that popped into my mind and it seemed like he made a lot of sense. The, uh, the whole idea of being separated through time and space was kind of a fun twist where, like, Foundations of Stone, you know, people are lost in Moria and they get separated in the caves and it's it's pretty cool. But this is kind of like taken to a whole other level where, like, we're not just, you know, in the same place in a different tunnel. We're like, I'm in ancient Egypt and you're in the future Chronopolis, you know, like that's... <laughs> kind of raises the stakes just a little bit i think it uh, it, it also gave us you know opportunity just to do, like all kinds of fun stuff like who doesn't want to fight a t-rex you know like i definitely want to see spider-man do a swinging web kick on a t-rex because that's the gotta be the coolest mental image ever um so with kang you know he's pulling in people and creatures from all throughout time and so that that was really kind of open door to do whatever we wanted as well Nice. So, uh, so this was actually a, like going to be like a Gen Con type thing. Yeah, the the plan is to debut at Gen Con. Like, um, oh, okay. I I don't know, you know, like FFG, FFG, and and our release models are continually evolving. So, you know, like what worked for Lord of the Rings, or what works for Arkham, isn't necessarily what's going to work for Marvel. But we do know that there is definitely a demand and an audience for Gen Con. Like, our Arkham and Lord of the Rings events sell out every single year. Um, I remember a couple years ago, uh, one of our uh, organized play directors <clears throat> decided to, like, really up our game and, like, just get as many seats as we could, particularly for Lord of the Rings, you know, because that's, that's the one that I was traditionally running. Uh, so I, I, I don't know all the information about Arkham, but with Lord of the Rings, it was like, okay... We're going to get so many seats that there's no way we're going to fill them all. We're actually going to finally find out what is the upper limit of Lord of the Rings. Um, and they all sold out, so we still don't know. <laughs> you know. It's just like, they're like, this game's been around forever. There's no way there's that many people that want to play. And it turns out, yes, there is. People really like coming to these events and playing with people. And so we know from that experience that like people are going to want to get together and play Marvel at these kind of events. And so we wanted to have something on hand that would be new and exciting, not necessarily exclusive. Well, that would have been the only way I could have enjoyed my game anymore is if we were at Gen Con and, you know, chatting with you and, and Mr. Boggs. And that would have been incredible. But Yeah, I will say that's probably the, the biggest thing that uh, the 2020 has, has robbed me of. So I know that's, that's a pretty first world problem. There's other people out there dealing with some real, yeah. some real stuff this year. So I, I respect that. This was kind of like, well, that's a bummer, but, you know, maybe next year. Yeah, for sure. Do you think the uh, Spider-Man with the swinging web kick at the T-Rex is cooler than the T-Rex potentially riding a goblin glider? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we I don't think we gave the T-Rex any, like, cannot have attachments text, did we? No. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that, where, where is he? Oh, no, no, he just has toughness, so absolutely, he is going to get... Up, you know what? Someone needs to put the temporal <laughs> modular set into uh, Zola, yes, and see what happens to that T Rex when Zola <laughs> starts experimenting on him. I was, a, I wanted to, I wanted to combine it with um, Doomsday Chair so I can get some biomechanical upgrades on that T Rex. Right, <laughs> right. So when you defeat it, it just comes back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're a bad person, banana. <laughs> you know, actually, that reminds me of like my favorite. Calvin and Hobbes uh, story, just just a single panel. <laughs> well, I used to I used to look forward to the Sunday paper just for the Calvin and Hobbes, and uh, 
you know, he used to do these beautiful paintings of dinosaurs. You, you'd have these hilarious drawings of Calvin and Hobbes, but every once in a while he'd just splash a beautiful painting in there to show you what an artist he was, right? And so he's got, like, a picture of, like, a stegosaurus or something, and it's really spooked, right? Like, you know, what's got him spooked? Oh, there's a, there's a Tyrannosaurus Rex somewhere out there, but what could be worse? Tyrannosaurus Rex piloting F-14s. It shows like a T-Rex, <laughs> like in a canopy of an F-14 with uh, goggles on and his little hands working the joystick. And now that's what I'm picturing, you know, like that's that's the next upgrade. I got to make a F-14 upgrade or something. So, or a goblin glider might just be the next best thing. What's worse than a T-Rex against Kang? A T-Rex with a goblin glider. I don't know. The Acronauts might be worse, man. I'm reading them. They're they're scary. <laughs> yeah, I haven't even touched them oh. yet. Yeah, Acronauts look nasty. They wow. they really are. Like that was kind of the whole point with them, right? Was uh, again, we're crafting the uh, sort of the standard experience that we want for people, and that's in the rules, right? That it's like, hey, we recommend you start with the temporal set. But we're also, you know, trying to respond to to feedback we see online. You know, and uh, take an opportunity of okay. Here's this this product that we're putting out, and there's room in the pack for some additional cards. You know, so what's the what's the best way to invest those cards? And uh, both Box and I kind of agreed, like, hey, if there's people out there that want more challenge, then let's give them something that's definitely more of a challenge. And so the Anachronauts was kind of this opportunity to say, hey, these are basically Kang's Avengers. You know, this is his pick, uh, selected team where he's chosen the best warriors from throughout time. And we couldn't even fit them all in there. You know, there's there's some others too, but we kind of took the ones that, that were the most uh, colorful and different from each other and then basically said, okay, if these are like his Avengers, let's just make them ridiculous. You know, let's just make these guys, like each time you reveal one of these, you just groan, you know, because they're going to come in and do some ridiculous stuff like, you know, Apocryphus here, when revealed, discard an ally or support you control. Plus, he's a, a one a scheme, three attack, four hit point minion. Like, yeah, that's going to gonna throw off your game a little bit, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I hope people enjoy, you know, people have been looking for more of a challenge. I, I hope they enjoy playing with the Anachronauts because we definitely didn't pull any punches on that set. I noticed in the in the rules insert that the the difficulty rating was back for the modular sets. Um, is it, I know people mention that all the time because it was in the core set and then it wasn't there for like goblin gimmicks or whatever and now now it's back again is that something that's going to keep like we'll get it sometimes sometimes we won't um, you know what's funny yeah that was something I, I chuckled because uh, I think Boggs and I were actually just talking about this um, the other day like I think as recent as Friday um obviously can't say the context uh, of the conversation but we we both kind of noticed that yeah that we we were talking about difficulty ratings and then kind of in that moment realized like oh yeah we didn't we didn't actually assign any difficulty ratings uh for anything after the core until apparently this product and i was like oh this product has difficulty ratings so apparently there's room for us to improve on uh consistency with difficulty ratings no, I don't think there's any real rhyme or reason there. I think the the fact is we probably got really busy with products and, and probably nobody noticed that there were not difficulty ratings until this one. It was probably a note. Uh, it was likely Nate French who, who read through the rules and commented like, hey, could you please assign difficulty ratings to these? Uh, so that's something we're just going to have to keep an eye out for as, as we move forward. Sounds good. I like I like that. I like the difficulty ratings personally. I think that's that's fun, just to give some people like a you know an idea of what they're in for. But man, this mm-hmm. even the, I'm reading Master of Time now too, and that's I'm just this is the pack that keeps giving for me. <laughs> I'm like so much, <laughs> so much more to go back and and face. I don't think this is one I'll ever be able to to compete with on heroic either. This is a this is a good one. I'm I'm a big fan. Oh yeah, man. I like that King Master of Time is is. Uh something we could only ever really get away with in uh in in this set right where yeah. where you have villains with subtitles we haven't had that before right because kang is is a unique villain um both in his power set but also his his comic book lore where 
he's done so much time traveling, right, that he's actually created all these branching timelines where he's a different person, slightly different person in each one. And uh, so normally you wouldn't want to include a, you know, a modular set featuring the villain because you wouldn't be able to use it with that villain, right? Like, for example, if we had a Rhino modular set in the core, maybe it wouldn't be terrible, but it would be kind of weird that you couldn't use it in one third of the core set scenarios, right? Because mm-hmm. you can't can't play a Rhino modular set with the Rhino villain. But here, because each Kang has their own subtitle, now you can include this Kang Master of Time minion, and he can exist side by side with Kang the Conqueror or Kang Immortus, right? So that was kind of fun. I, I that's one of my favorite things about Kang: the fact that, that there's a whole council of Kangs in in the comic lore, right? Where where there's so many of them that they all meet from time to time to like plan the future of of the multiverse. <laughs> I love the the <laughs> new uh, the villainous keyword too on Kang. That's really cool. Yeah, I gotta give props. I gotta give props to uh, Snoop Buggy Boggs for coming up with villainous. That was. <laughs> That was his idea, that uh, he had come up with that for something else he was working on. And I was like, that's really cool. Do you mind if I borrow that for uh, yeah, for some of the minions in here? Because, yeah, you've got it on Kang, who absolutely needs it, right? That he, he has to be villainous. But then you also have, um, wait, which one? It's one of the Anachronauts. Yeah, Death Hunt. <laughs> that's my favorite. Favorite worst name for a villain ever, Death Hunt 9000. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, he's got villainous as well. Um, yeah, so watch out for those guys. Yeah, that's nasty. I love it. Man, I'm poof, blown away. <laughs> Tommy's just been gushing ever since I, I'm like, he played I'm, it. Yeah, I got, like, I got like a crush on you in a weird way. Don't tell my wife. It's real weird right now. But <laughs> it's, I'm just, I'm, 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 I can't tell you how much fun I had. I don't know if that is, for whatever that's worth, one person, well, two people, me and Scott, had a blast unbelievable now that's worth a lot man it's it's why we do what we do i i really appreciated the shout out on facebook that's that's always yep. great to see you everybody know everybody like... needed to know everybody i knew was playing squadrons <laughs> and i was like no you need to stop turn off your computer play find a friend, and play some cat <laughs> yep now get it on skype both. squadrons looks pretty amazing it does but i i, I agree it looks amazing but kang kang was the was the uh the release for this weekend i'm telling you Unbelievable. Great. You were talking about you and um, like Kang as a modular set too with Master of Time. Do you think in the future you'd ever go back and add like um, a modular version of villains that have already released, so that later on? Yeah, I sure won't say no to it. Um, I think. I'm trying to think if we've we haven't done it yet, have we? Or have we? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be out yet. <laughs> um, but so definitely, we got Taskmaster, well, right? That's actually the... no, no, no. I guess I guess we kind of yeah. We have the Taskmaster uh, Nemesis set, which is not exactly a modular set, but yeah, we have we have the Taskmaster minion uh, in in the Black Widow pack, and then we have the Taskmaster villain. We also did the print and play uh, Ronan the Accuser, and uh, we're, we're definitely going to see him in the Guardians of the Galaxy. I think that was something we that we already talked about uh, when when we released that set. So it's uh, it's it's definitely something that we can explore. You know, it's just gonna it's going to depend when when is the right time to do it. That's all. Yeah, and even print and play. I don't know if that's something you plan on revisiting, but that seems like a good home for something like that too. I was really, really, really uh, surprised and excited by the the reception to uh, to that print and play set. Like, first of all, Boggs again, just just killing it on this game line. Like, I'm really fortunate to uh, to have uh, you know him to work with and bounce ideas off of because like, he's just got so much stuff. Like, villainous again. Like, that's that's such a natural keyword to have in the game. Uh, so, first of all, it was just it was a really well done set. Uh, and he put that together like pretty quickly, you know. Um, but also, yeah, just people being so receptive to that kind of medium or, or just you know that kind of content, it really does open up a lot of possibilities. And, and I and I do hope 
that uh, as a team we can find some ways to revisit that and make use of it. Um, so time will tell. Yeah, I like the dynamic of just that mini boss like feature there. Mm-hmm. It seems like a good home for for some of the villains that might be a little larger than than life for like a modular set. So I, yeah, I that really... was that was. That kind of grew out of the Gen Con. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, please, not please at all. I was that. done. You're good. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just I just wanted to kind of give credit to, uh, you know, the uh, the executive team. You know, they, when when we had to kind of, um, you know, uh, call an audible on on Gen Con as as the convention was canceled, and then it was like, what do we do to 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 promote our our games and generate that buzz that we normally get, you know, uh, by by going to Indianapolis that time of year. Um, you know, it, it actually was something that came from the top down. That they're like, "Hey, how about if we just did something print and play, made something available on our website?" And so I, I just like to, uh, I like to reassure people from time to time that the, you know, people running the studio are actually really smart people. You know, who've been in the industry for a really long time, and they have some really, really good ideas. That that so that a lot of the ideas come from the card game, uh, you know, team from from me and Boggs or, or from Nate. You know, but other times they they come, you know, from our from our studio heads, you know, and the executive team. So that, that's pretty exciting. I really liked when they, when they brought that to us and said, Hey, is this something you could do? And, and we were like, yeah, that actually sounds really great. So, you know, we kind of all put our heads together and made it happen. And so to see it, um, get such a warm reception really felt like, okay, you know, uh, that might be one of those little silver linings around, uh, you know, Gen Con being canceled this year is that it forced us to, try something we probably would not have tried otherwise and find out that there is an audience for that. And, and that's another way that we can uh, promote, you know, Marvel champions. That's I, uh, for me. I got to say that uh, before Kang, which is my, my favorite, uh, I think champions product at this point, the uh, Ronin modular set was like my favorite thing that had been put out so far. So that's awesome. You guys are killing it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. The future could not look any brighter. Uh, just coming off of those, like like Banana said, the Ronin followed by the Rise of Red Skull box, which I would give like a four out, four point nine out of five stars. And the only reason it's not five is because I just want to leave some room to grow. <laughs> uh, it, and then you go right into uh, this Kang set, which just breaks my my scoring chart. Uh, it's just I, I'm thrilled. And now we get all these new heroes. You know, we get four new heroes, and then we're back at it with a campaign box again and i'm just mm-hmm. couldn't couldn't be more excited for the i'm glad it does it does feel like we're we're hitting our stride now like you know i think looking back i i think if we could go back and do things just a little different maybe we wouldn't have you know released so many heroes in a row before getting more campaign content out there but the good news is you know we're it, you know the, the game's never going to have to wait that long for a new scenario again because now we're we, you know, we're we're hitting our rhythm here with uh, campaign campaign box, you know, coming out, you know, regularly, um, mm-hmm. and and really, I I appreciate what you're saying about 4.9 out of five. Like, I, I totally get that because I know how awesome uh, the galaxy's most wanted is, and uh, you you might need a different scoring system for that one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great news. I'm I'm so excited. So excited, mm-hmm. man! And also, the, to to your credit too, the the heroes coming out or whoever schedules the releases. I mean, the way those heroes lined up, it was really unfortunate. Again, first world problems, you know, with the, all the shipping delays, and, and I'm mm-hmm. sure there's been production delays that happened in the middle of that, where it probably wouldn't have felt as drawn out without you know new villains and encounters, if there hadn't been that misfortune there. So I mean. I, I yeah, that's still true. Think... We we did we did get interrupted pretty bad with the yeah. uh, with with coronavirus. So I think it it threw us off by at least a month. I know we tried to release some stuff kind of closer together to uh, to account for it. Um, in any case, though, I I think honestly it just taught us that people do really like their hero packs. It seems like they're getting positive reception, but you know we need to make sure that uh, that we're giving players something new to take their heroes against. You know, before too long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Love, sure. I got one more question for you. What are you and and not? I'm not trying. I'm not digging for spoilers. So don't if it's if you're reading something for research purposes, don't mention it. But what are you what are you reading right Dude, now? Dude, I'll just hang up. I'll just go cold. You'll be like, "Can't hey, be there." <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll you. 
You, you don't <laughs> ask me those questions. <laughs> the master of time I'm disappeared. Sorry, <laughs> well, I was going to say, what are you reading not related to research for the game? If you if you are reading anything from Marvel or comic book world otherwise. Yeah, I'm pretty much constantly reading stuff from Marvel. I've got uh, I've got quite the collection uh, here here in Minnesota. We have a well, it's not just Minnesota, but there's there's a, a book chain called Half Price Books, and uh, there's there's one right near the FFG offices. There's another one pretty close to where I live, and you know it's not just books. They got like all kinds of use, like video games, movies. You know, sometimes Legos, pretty dope. So I'm I'm always there. I'm I'm there at least once a week looking for for something new to read. And so my comic book collection has has really blown up since I, you know, moved to this area. Access to the to uh, these half price bookstores. Um, so pretty much, um, I just like to to keep something, you know, uh, nearby that I can that I can just kind of pour over whenever I'm bored. So um, I'll I'll go into my closet where I got all all my books. I you know when you got little kids, you got to keep your comic books like in a closet somewhere. Mm-hmm. So they don't get into them. Um, so recently, I've actually been reading some Marvel uh, Star Wars, uh, of all things. Um, I, I really liked when, so, you know, Disney owns Marvel. And then when Disney got Lucasfilm, it was like, all right, it's time for Marvel to start making Star Wars comics. And they really put some of their top talents into it. The, uh, the Darth Vader series is second to none. It's just a fantastic series. And it was a lot of original new characters. Um but I also had like the main Star Wars book that uh, I kind of collected sporadically, so I was kind of going back to the beginning of that and and rereading like the the first you know twelve issues or so. I just finished with that, and so I decided I wanted some more Avengers in my life. So I'm uh, reading some uh, Avengers just pre pre Avengers versus X Men era. I don't know exactly what year that is, but just before all of that happened, you know, they were dealing with. Uh, Norman Osborn and his Hammer Agency, you know, trying to replace Shield, and uh, some really interesting story stuff there. So yeah, I'm I'm kind of constantly in that world. You know, it was it was my hobby before before we got the license. So now it's just a good fortune that I get to combine my passions. Is that the is that the Jonathan Hickman Avengers? Or is oh, that it's close. That? It's this is the Bendis stuff. Okay. So I think it's it's before right. Okay. So the the Hickman stuff is actually some of my favorite Avengers uh, storytelling of all time. I really enjoy Bendis' uh, new Avengers run, you know, starting with Avengers Disassembled and then sort of relaunching the team with the new Avengers. That was a really great place for me to mm-hmm. jump in because I hadn't ever really read um, Avengers before. That I was more of an X-Men kid growing up. Um, so... That seemed like a really cool story where they just kind of he just kind of blew up the Avengers as we knew them, and then he sort of reformed them with, uh, you know, a smaller team and a new focus. Um, and then yeah, Hickman came after, and and did some really amazing stuff leading up to Secret Wars two, right? With like the end of the Ultimate Universe and and everything else. Um, I actually bought that series for my dad. The uh, it's called oh. Time Runs Out. I think that's the one you were thinking about where yep. they realized that. Uh, the multiverses are all colliding with each other and earth is like the focal point where two earths will collide and both universes are destroyed. Right. Yeah. And they keep, and the Avengers they keep have destroying to figure other earths. It's real, yeah, it's real yeah. stick. It's real the, dark. I loved it. And, and yeah, as it's just like the best Avengers story ever. Cause it's like, what do you do when you're faced with an unwinnable scenario? Cause of course, Steve Rogers, Captain America, he's not going to condone, blowing up another planet to save his own, right? They're always, Mm -hmm. from his point of view, there always has to be another way, right? And then you got people like Tony Stark where you're kind of like, which way is he going to go on this, you know? And then, of course, you have someone like Namor who's like, you know, I represent Atlantis, so I will blow up anything to protect Atlantis, you know? (laughs) (laughs) It's just just fascinating stuff. It's just riveting. And then the... (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) <laughs> just kidding. I love I love the X Men. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've I've read that one uh, several times over because it's just so riveting. You know, there there are these comic storylines that just seem to uh, elevate the entire medium to a whole yeah. other level. Like Civil War was probably the first one that truly did that for me. I mean, there's some there's some fantastic Chris Claremont runs on the X Men that are 
just top notch and, and uh, head and shoulders above everything else at that time. But I think for me, Civil War was the first one to kind of really make you think, like, what if all this was real? What would the kind of consequences be? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, yeah, for me, that whole time runs out leading up to Secret Wars 2 is, is kind of one of those story arcs as well. I'm trying to get Banana to read um, as as a relatively new father and Banana being, you know, a relatively new father as well. I'm trying to get him to read. Uh, it's really long, but it's Hickman's whole run on Fantastic Four and uh, the Future Foundation and all of that because the conclusion yeah. of that story is insane. But mm-hmm. I have the yeah, traits. So I, was... father five. I just have to read them. Yeah, it's super good. I'll actually second that recommendation because I was never really a Fantastic Four fan. Um, I don't think I really had much against them. They just never really appealed to me. Like I was familiar with the characters because they always show up in X Men stories or Avengers stories, and it always seemed like, you know, uh, Invisible Woman and Human Torch and Thing would kind of just be there to like hold off the enemy while Reed Richards used his genius power to create some machine and win the day, and mm-hmm. and that storytelling didn't really excite me. Um, but then after reading the whole uh, Jonathan Hickman Avengers Times Runs Out uh, storyline, you know, I became aware of the Jonathan Hickman Fantastic Four storyline, which I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go and look at that. Uh, and again, Half Price Books there to save the day. You know, I just find all the trades and pick them up. And uh, I really fell in love with the Fantastic Four through, through that story because it, it gave each one of them a very important role in the story. And the overarching story, of course, because that's how Hickman writes, right? He's just seeding all these details along the way until he, like, pulls it all together and blows your mind. Um, it really was. Yeah, it really was fantastic. And, and the element of family in there is just present throughout. So absolutely worth a read. Was that fantastic line, like, an intended pun or unintended? Uh, no, I just ramble. <laughs> okay. I have all the trades for that. I just need to take the time to read them. It's a long one. But it's good. So I'll ask this: What's your favorite like comic run um, that you've read? Oh gosh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, my favorite comic. I, I want. Guess, I want Tommy to answer this too. Then. Well, Tommy, do you, do you know yours? Because I need to think on mine. I, I'm go- I'm not trying to cop out, but like I, I'm kind of like a. I would waver on like what what I'm into at the moment and like right now that Fantastic Four one is just speaking to me like I literally have read it twice like recently mm-hmm. just because I, it's just I don't know it just got me so that I right now that would be my favorite one and that's the first time Fantastic Four has ever been at that level for me it's always been Avengers or X-Men back and forth although mm-hmm. the uh, the new stuff that Hickman's writing for the X-Men now is still is pretty wild too I, I like Jonathan Hickman a lot in case you can't tell have you, yeah, you um, know, it's, it's kind of sad. The, the X-Men one has really failed to grab me. The, the House, of, House of X, Powers of Ten, that was brilliant. Mm-hmm. You know, it got me so excited because, in truth, it's kind of been a while since we got a really good X-Men run. Like, there's definitely been good X-Men stories, but they've, they've been kind of interrupted with really lackluster um, X-Men stories. So when, when that came out, that, that House of X, Powers of Ten book, it felt like he was just kind of kicking down the doors or like, you know, just opening up the floodgates of like great X-Men stories are back. Yeah. But the whole Don of X thing kind of lost me. It just kind of like, you know, I know he's a fan of slow burn, but this just felt so meandering and, and disconnected mm-hmm. that I was like, you know, maybe I'll eat my words in a year from now when he starts pulling it all together and I'd be happy to be wrong. I really would. Nothing would make me happier than to see amazing X-Men storytelling. But uh, me and my buddy were actually talking about this because we both just kind of lost interest. We kind of quit following it, unfortunately. So hopefully, he'll he'll, he'll turn it around. You know, reveal his master plan. I'm um, not I'm not current on it, but from what I read of it, I enjoyed. I, I felt like you did. I was like, oh man, maybe X Men are back, and then, so I'm kind of disappointed to hear <laughs> that from you. But I'm probably gonna see it through anyway. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll, like a like my. My thing is that comic books, you know, they can always start out so strong and then just go sideways so quickly that I kind of I kind of gave up on collecting monthlies like years ago. You know, I had, I had fallen away from the 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 hobby uh, for a long time anyway. And uh, 
I kind of got back into it around the time Guardians of the Galaxy came out because, you know, Marvel's done this thing where, where when the new movie's coming out, they're going to relaunch the book and they're going to put their best talent on it to draw attention to it. And uh, so they put uh, Steve McNiven as the artist and Brian Michael Bendis as the writer on the new Guardians of the Galaxy just before the first movie came out. And, you know, that's one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite artists. And so I decided to start collecting the monthlies again. And, yeah, it started out great. And it and actually continued to go on great. But it was right around, like, issue seven or eight that the story just got interrupted by some kind of crossover or something. And they had, like, a guest artist for a couple of months. And it just threw me so badly that I was like, yep, yeah, nope, that's why I stopped doing that. I prefer to wait till the trade comes out and I can kind of see all of what I'm getting, you know, before I pick it up. But back when I did used to buy monthlies and that, I'm thinking, like, there were... So I was super into X-Men. Um, as far as favorites, that's tough, because I feel like I have to categorize, but I don't want to keep you here all night. So <laughs> I'll just go with what I've read the most. Uh, and and still, in my mind, holds up. And that's, that's the, uh, you know, the, the widely popular X-Men number one by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee. You know, back in like 1991, um, I think they call it mutant genesis now when you buy the, the trade. And uh, it was just, you know, capturing a new audience, introducing them to the X-Men. So, you know, issue one starts with like this amazing danger room, you know, uh, story arc where the, the X-Men are divided into different teams and they're all battling each other. Like Wolverine's leading Psylocke and Gambit through the through the sewers to try to break into the X mansion. And they're, they're supposed to tag professor X, you know, that's, that's the job is. And uh, at first you don't realize it's a danger room thing, right? You think they're actually attacking the mansion and it's not until the thing's over that you see all the holograms kind of fading away. And it's this classic X Men stuff. That's one of the things I always liked about those books is that they would, they wouldn't just move from threat to threat. You know, they take time out at the mansion for you to see the heroes just interacting with each other at home you know, and, and build on those relationships and those dynamics. But then ultimately, you know, we get Magneto, you know, Magneto gets involved and uh, I'm, he's still my favorite villain. And I love seeing, you know, he and professor X, you know, have these, uh, the, these sparring sessions, you know, with these competing visions. And I love seeing Cyclops, you know, lead the team and come up with a plan for how they're going to take down Magneto and his acolytes, you know, how are they going to infiltrate asteroid M you know, you got the Blackbird. It just has everything. It has everything you could want from X Men story, and it's just in the first three issues. You know, it's just just absolutely blew my mind as a kid. And uh, I recently got like a, it's such a popular story arc that they 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 did like some kind of um, remastered edition. I guess is what you call it. if you you know if it's like when an old movie comes out on Blu Ray, right? And they uh, they give it the remaster <laughs> treatment. So they actually did this where they took, you know, those first, I don't know, uh, I want to say like six or seven issues of, of that X-Men run. And they kind of uh, applied the, the modern um, comic book techniques where, you know, if, if you've been collecting comic books as long as I had, you know that comics look very different in the late 80s, early 90s to how they look now because everything's done on computer now. You know, artists are actually just drawing on a tablet, you know, and applying these these awesome colors and that and it looks really sharp and so they applied all that treatment to it and it just looks uh, better than ever so that was a real treasure to find that the uh the biggest thing i noticed between like uh eight, late 80s early 90s comics to today is that there's there's way less straps and pouches um on people today <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and 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 women have more clothes for the most part yeah, yeah, it's usually skin tight still. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's that way for the guys, too. That's true. You know what? That's only fair. <laughs> yeah, everybody's still ripped. Yeah. Everybody's still wearing skin tight clothing. But, yeah, there's definitely <laughs> fewer pouches. <laughs> I like pouches on pouches. That was... That's, that's more a, a life field thing, I guess. Um, have yeah, you... yeah, I think he actually... He got so much grief for all the pouches his characters had that I think he he made some like um, mock character called the pouch. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I never I actually I never really followed any of Liefeld's books. I like I like Jim Lee. I liked Mark Silvestri, Will Portasio, pretty much all the guys that went on to Wildstorm um, when they left uh, Marvel. Right. 
have either of you read the uh, the Uncanny X Force run by Rick? I think it's pronounced Remender. Um, I think it was from like two thousand ten. I know the one you're talking about. Is that the one with Storm and Puck? No, it has or, um. Or is that, it has Phantom is that X. The Black Ops team. Yeah, it's oh, the okay, Black yeah, Ops yeah. teams. I think that's like my favorite run. Just throwing that out there. If you haven't read it, is a, a weird dude. He's got a, some weird stuff going on with him. <laughs> Phantom X is yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, he is awesome, but he's got some weird stuff going on. You just that, like you do like a double take as you're reading. You're like, what? What? <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that's the one with uh, like Apocalypse, right? And, yeah, uh, and Archangel plays a big role in that. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's like Archangel, yeah. uh, Psylocke, Phantom X, Wolverine, and Deadpool, and it's like like a well written Deadpool. So it's not mm-hmm. like a a crazy. Um, Deadpool kills them all. I was the reading universe. the X Men stories. I was reading the X Men stories that that were coming out around this around the same time, with like the uh, Messiah Complex and the Second Coming, where where uh, Cyclops is because that X Force team that like that formed kind of on Cyclops' orders, right? Where he was like, "I want you to." He's t- talking to Wolverine. He's like, "I want you to put together a Black Ops team." Like, we can't afford to to wait for people to attack us anymore. Like we have to take in a more aggressive approach. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, their, yeah, their, their goal like, is to you know, Charles would never do this. Right. Like Xavier would never condone this. And he's basically like, yeah, well, Xavier doesn't run the show anymore. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- their yeah. mission is to, to kill, um, apocalypse, like baby apocalypse. So, <laughs> right. But not just apocalypse, right? Like from there, they go on to like, he just, whatever threats that, yeah, know, it goes from there. Terrifying. It goes from there. And then it circles, it circles back to apocalypse. And like Phantom X saved Apocalypse and is like raising him like in his his brain world. Oh yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So yeah, that's a good run for anybody listening. Um, I think that's it for like our questions and like general conversation with you. I know Tommy has something he wants to talk about with our draft league. Um, and if you would help yeah. us out with that. So for anybody that made it, if you're not a comic book fan, I'm sorry for the past 20 minutes, but we love it. I enjoyed all that conversation. Um, So, but to go back to the draft league, we have um, a draft league that we run on our discord. Um, This season, uh, we uh, all played two player games with drafted heroes and aspects, and we faced off against the campaign. You played all five scenarios recording your number of losses. We have a a handful of teams that, I think there's like five or six at this point of the 18 ish that we had that wound up going undefeated through the campaign 5-0 on expert and we need a tiebreaker game caleb so mm. we're coming to you can you give us whatever encounter you want with whatever modular multiple modular sets on whatever difficulty you want heroic 10 please no please nothing over <laughs> heroic one maybe <laughs> Um, Are these supposed to be, like, extra punishing or something? No. Uh, we like to make them, like, feasible but challenging is, is our okay. goal. Um, we didn't know, I mean, when we planned this this season, we didn't really have any way to tell how difficult or not difficult the campaign would be. And also, the, sure. you, know, you get upgrades throughout the campaign, which so, I think helps So you. the goal of the draft is, is to have fun, right? The goal it of the is, draft isn't to, it to is just to have get fun. kicked in the face. Okay. But at this point, I, when we're at the tiebreaker game, I do, I, I mean, I kind of want it to be a little punishing at the tiebreaker. Okay. I mean, everybody went 5-0 through the campaign. So we oh, definitely wow. want, we definitely want, you know, a, a tick up. Okay. So. Well, I can, I can give you something that we actually uh, tested in development and decided it was too hard, so we pivoted. Uh, when we were developing <laughs> Red Skull, right? Like we were, we were really excited to uh, to be able to take advantage of the fact that Madame Hydra was in the core set as mm. as an additional modular set. Oh shit! And so, of course, she appears she appears wow. in uh, in Crossbones, right? And that was kind of fun because she helps drive the story. And so, having her in the actual adventure makes the story just a little bit more tangible. Uh, so originally, I was like, you know, I really like that set. It's a real tight set, right? You got Madame Hydra, two copies of the Legion of Hydra side scheme, and then three times the Hydra Soldier minion, which is just so thematically appropriate for pretty much everything in Rise of Red Skull. Um, so, you know, we're getting toward the end of the box. I'm like, I'd really like to use that set again. You know, wouldn't it be awesome if she returned uh, for the Red Skull scenario? 
you know, to me, that would kind of bring it full circle, right? Kind of like, where has she been all this time? Oh, well, she brought the, you know, the reality stone to Red Skull, and now she's hanging out with Red Skull. And um, one of the things that I needed when I was developing that set is like, well, I need a, I need some some side schemes, and whatever modular set I put in, I'm going to need some side schemes. And it comes with two of them, and they're Hydra three. So like, what could be more perfect? Well, it turned out when we played it, it's like. That is so brutal because each time you reveal legions of Hydra, it makes you go and get Madame Hydra. And because Red Skull's making you reveal one of these side schemes every turn, you know, these are guaranteed they're going to come up. And, of course, you know, his whole thing is he gets powered up by the number of side schemes in play, so you're always trying to clear those out. But Madame Hydra gets in the way of that. You know, you cannot remove threat from that side scheme while Madame Hydra's in play. Um and, you know, the fact that when you reveal Legions of Hydra, you're putting two additional threat on there for each uh, Hydra enemy in place. So you're getting Madam Hydra's two, and then you're getting Red Skull's two. So that's guaranteed that seventh threat you've got to remove off of that side scheme after you defeat Madam Hydra. You know, that's not counting if there's any other Hydra soldiers or minions in play. So uh, I think that would be a pretty fun challenge, um, would be to, to use that set. And I actually have to look at Red Skull here to remember how many modular sets uh that he that he uses because i'm not sure which one you you'd replace so i believe uh, it's just the see. one is it just the one i think that it's just hydra sense. patrol I okay think. well let's see um hydra assault and hydra patrol okay, ah, so okay. Got, he's using both of those yeah and well, i like hydra assault has the hail hydra treachery but i think hydra patrol also has a side scheme. Each player searches the encounter deck, discard pill for a Hydra minion. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you want a challenge, if you want a challenge, I would sub out the Hydra Assault and replace it with the uh, with the Madam Hydra, the Legions of Hydra set. This, I don't know, this might be too mean because that's going to put a grand total of six, that's six Hydra soldiers in your deck, all with guard <laughs> and all making you reveal another card when you defeat them. So you have to defeat them. This is perfect. and you have to get another card. I love like it. I don't think you need to do heroic to make this challenging. I think expert will be enough. Agreed. But I could be wrong. Maybe you guys are like super pros and you're just gonna eat this stuff for breakfast, you know. Um, I have one I more like the Hydra patrols team being in there because then everybody has to go in and, and get a minion. Either one is really fine. Like, the, the Hydra Assault set's pretty gnarly, too. Oh, I wonder which one's actually worse. Because Hydra Assault, man, they got the flame soldiers, you know, that uh, you, you can't let those guys, guy, you can't let them go undefended. Or they're just, you know, blowing up your supports. You got Quick Strike on the Jet Trooper. Um, and then the Hail Hydra Treachery is pretty awesome. Yeah, either one of those. But definitely... Definitely try it with Madam Hydra. I love it. I'm I'm sold. So, t Tommy, I have a question for you uh, in regards I, to this. I think that's perfect. So, <laughs> is expert? We're gonna we'll do we'll do legions, right? Legions and, and patrol. What do you think? Yeah. Well, definitely legions, and then from there, I it's hard to say which is. Well, I guess patrol. I, if you're going for a really crazy challenge, patrol has to be worse just because the sheer volume. Of extra cards you're getting. Yeah, I'm just. I like the the idea of all those when defeated dealing and the engaged player. Right. Card. I just and the Hydra that. regular. You know, he's he's a he's kind of a pushover, but he's got that insight one, so he's mm -hmm. he's raising the 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 threat every time it comes up. Yeah. Yeah, when you're running when you're running a little hot on that uh, on that last scheme and that insight one comes up and ends mm -hmm. the game, that's what I'm looking forward to that mm -hmm. table flip moment. <laughs> So, Tommy, I have a question for you as a housekeeping thing in regards to this. Okay. Are, are we going to continue the campaign theme and add the experimental weapons that everyone had the whole time and nah. allow? Okay. Nope. <laughs> okay. No, no weapons, no campaign stat, upgrades. Campaign okay. Upgrades, nothing. You're going right. in. You're full health. That's your that's your bonus. All right. That's I'm on board with that. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So, that's extra red skull. Hydra Patrol, Legions of Hydra, no upgrades, and see the pinned messages for tiebreakers, stats to keep track of. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Thanks for helping us out with that, Caleb. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. Appreciate it.
<laughs> yeah, my, my pleasure. Yeah, if you guys like that little nugget, uh, I can also say that uh, a, a close second was uh, we had a similar thing with, with Zola, where originally we were going to use the Doomsday Chair uh, modular set because, you know, it comes with three upgrades that go on minions, and that's the whole theme of, of Zola, right? And so I thought it was perfect because, you know, Modok and Zola, they're, they're both into experimenting and, and doing crazy things, merging, you know, Big face biology and mechanics. And so, <laughs> um, yeah, right, just just larger-than-life characters. Uh, well, AIM, AIM and Hydra, they, they have a long history together. So I was – originally that was the plan. I really liked the theme of that. But, again, it was this feedback of, like, oh, my gosh, biomechanical upgrades – on these minions is just horrific. And then you had some of these that can go and fetch it and get it back, you know, and my testers were just so sick of seeing biomechanical upgrades that they were like, please just don't recommend this set. Like, you know, not for standard, you know, so that's, that's when we pivoted to under attack, which, which works just fine. But um, when you guys are done playing red skull with legions of Hydra and you're still, still hungry for a challenge, try, try putting the doomsday chair into, uh, into Zola and have fun with that it's definitely on our short list i know that i love that idea you gonna have time for that with all the all the kang you're gonna be playing on <laughs> oh man see i'm t- so torn in so many different directions i don't huh. kang is is my true love i can't lie but i'm sure i'll find time <laughs> the once in future true love of tommy's king that's true um all right, well, Caleb, uh, thanks for joining us again. You're, this is your second time on, so I'm going to call you a friend of the show. Um, <laughs> so thanks for being here. Whether you like it or not. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, what would it say if I said I wasn't your friend? Like, <laughs> I'll be on your show, but I'm not your friend. Don't, don't talk to me. It would be fair. <laughs> I don't want to be banana's be friend either. <laughs> It'd be fair. Just... <laughs> I just put up a really good front for like you know an yeah. hour, mm-hmm. then as soon as we're out, as soon as we're done recording, you guys like, yeah, hey, thanks for being on. That was great. No, no, we're done. <laughs> yeah, Don't ever message asshole. me again. Yeah, yeah. Listen, no, it's it's my pleasure, guys. I, I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, representing the game and, and getting people hyped up for it and. And just sharing your enthusiasm, uh, even with me, that, that really means a lot. So uh, thanks for all you guys do. I'm happy to be a friend of the show. Awesome. Thank you very much. You got any last words, Tommy? Negative. I'm good. Just go play Kang, people. If you haven't played Kang, stop playing Squadrons and go play Kang. You will not regret it. Play multiplayer, though. you got to have friends playing with you. And use our table, uh, our house rule. When you're in different time streams, don't talk to each other. <laughs> Just like Caleb and us after the show. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so for- I, took, I took that joke too far. I'm sorry. The sarcasm didn't really translate very well. Uh, Some, someone back at FFG Marketing is going to be like, Caleb, please don't ever try to be sarcastic on the show again. It's, just, it's not playing well. We're too much like Drax. It's too literal for us. So yeah, nothing flies over my head. I'll catch it. That's right. Uh, that's it for the side scheme. Stay scheming, champions. You ready for another bout? Awesome. Well, I get, get the hell sleepy. out of here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, thank you again, Caleb. Re- really, really appreciate it.